real life dog stirs up trouble between the infamous Charlie Seeger and his brothers and a well known criminal family in Liverpool. What follows is a bloody feud with horrific acts of violence and is detailed in the book Killer by Charlie Seeger himself. There was one firm in particular at that time in Liverpool and they were good at their work. In fact, I'll go as far as saying they were the best. They had several nightclubs which were successful and I had respect for that firm, like they did for me. Their names were the Hughes brothers and I've known them since we were young kids. They were smart young men at that time and they came from Houghton, like me. There was only one problem. They socialised with a certain person whose nickname was the dog. And believe me, that's just what he was, an effing dog. In fact, it's too good a word for him. I've met some terrible people in my life, but the one with the worst personality was this dog character. I was having a drink one night in a club called The Hollywood in Duke Street, Liverpool City Centre. Who should walk in that night but the dog? He came over to me after a short while and asked if I wanted a drink, which I accepted. I began to sense something odd, as I knew deep down he didn't really like me. I thought, he's up to something, that's for sure. We got into conversation, and he kept asking me where a certain friend of mine was. I told him I'd be seeing him shortly in another club called Chauffeurs in Hope Street. After a while, I ended up in the club with the dog and his pal of mine who the dog was anxious to meet. After a bit of chit-chat, the dog went to the bar for a round of drinks. Whilst he was gone, my pal said to me that the dog wanted him to get around the table with the Hughes brothers and let certain things drop. Apparently, the Hugheses had had a falling out with this pal of mine, who was heavy at the time. He said he would not make friends with any of the Hugheses, he just wanted to do them in. I tried to persuade him to forget it and make up. After all, it was down to the gossip mongers spreading rumours around, but he wasn't having any of it. He said he was still going to do them in. When the dog came back with the drinks, he started getting sarcastic with me and was really getting bang out of order. Little did the dog realise, but I myself was trying to get this pal to make friends with the Hugheses as well. Then he said another sarcastic remark to me, but I wasn't having any of it. We both started arguing. I ended up kicking off on him. I smashed him up and he ended up on the floor out cold. I apologised to the owner of the club, Charlie Scott, and some of the customers nearby. I really didn't want this, but I'd been left with no choice. It was either me or him. A few days later, my young nephew, Paul, was attacked. The people who'd done it told our Paul that they were looking for me. One of the men who'd attacked him was a Londoner, and he said he was going to shoot me. I always take things like that with a pinch of salt, because anybody with a bit of sense who really was going to shoot you wouldn't let anyone know they were going to do it. I knew that slimy dog was behind all of this. I knew also he had gone back to the Hughes brothers and twisted the story around, spreading malicious rumours about me. Well, I thought, nobody's going to hunt me. I'll go and hunt them. I called on my three brothers and my nephew Paul to come with me. We were all dead loyal, and I knew in my heart we would all die for one another. That weekend, we got tooled up and bought a van and went looking for them. I wanted to try and place them where they were all together. Every night we were out looking for them. And then a few nights later, we had good information that they were all in a pub in Houghton called the Yew Tree. We drove to the Yew Tree pub, and before we went in, I made sure we were all armed to the teeth. I had two weapons on me, a hammer, a meat cleaver, the handle of which I'd strapped to my wrist. There's nothing worse when you're going into a bloodbath than losing or dropping your weapon. Before we steamed into this crowd, I just made double sure none of us would come unstuck. I remembered a few months before, a fella I know, who doesn't want to be named, went into a club in town to shoot someone. He had a double barrel shotgun with him. He did shoot the person he was after, then he made a major mistake. He fired the other shot into the ceiling as he was leaving the club. He was quickly overpowered and pounced on by a few villains before he could reload the gun. The gang who jumped him cut him to pieces with a standing knife. I was just making sure I wasn't going to make a mistake like that. We were going to go in there fast, do the business and get out fast. The person who had given us this information came out of the pub to meet us and told us they were all together at the centre of the bar. I said to my brothers, come on, let's do it. We all walked in quickly and headed straight for the bar. The place was fairly crowded with customers, but we spotted them. I walked right up to them and it all kicked off. The tools came out. There was blood everywhere. It got messy. There were people screaming their heads off. 
two of the people had their hands hanging off. It didn't take long and we were out of there fast. The next day it was headline news. Two men were in hospital with their hands nearly chopped off. One of them was the dog. While they were both in hospital, a girl I knew who had a sister who worked as a nurse there and she was looking after the two men who had been butchered. Whenever the police questioned the two men, the nurse would listen to what was being said and it would get relayed back to me. A few days later, I was arrested by the heavy mob who came in force for me. I was taken to Eaton Road Police Station and charged with wounding with intent to kill. After being in the police cells for a couple of days, I was remanded in custody to HMP Risley. When I arrived at Risley, I was in remand prison clothes. The police had taken my civilian clothes from me for, for, for forensic testing. Remand prisoners had to wear brown jackets and trousers and cons wore blue. There was always a pecking order in remand prisons at that time. If a prisoner was wearing his own clothes, which was allowed for remand prisoners, he was classed as one of the boys. But the rest of the cons... But if a prisoner wore the prison brown, he was frowned upon by some of his fellow inmates. Only the tramps and the low life wore that prison clothes because their own torn, dirty clothes wouldn't be fit to wear. The next morning, after a sleepless night and realising where I was, I said to myself, what the F am I doing in here? I queued up for breakfast with the rest of the cons. I was starving after having been in the police cell for two days. I wouldn't eat anything from them. Now, because you won't play ball or make a statement, the police have been known to spit and piss on your food before they bring it to you. I wasn't taking any chances, so I'd just done without for a couple of days. I knew my family would be visiting me that day with a clean set of clothes and some decent food would be brought in for me. But right now I was famished. When it came to my turn in the breakfast queue, it was beans on the menu, a couple of rounds of bread and a mug of tea. I held my tray out and the prisoner who was dishing out the beans gave me a tiny portion, just about a spoonful. I said, do us a favour, pal. Give us a bit more. I'm starving. Now, don't forget I was dressed in prison brown and I hadn't had a shave for a few days. He looked at me with contempt and said, F off you tramp. This no mark who was dishing that food out to me had just made a grave mistake by thinking I was a lowlife. I just went loopy. The tray I was holding was made of stainless steel, so I started smashing his head in with it. Then all hell broke loose. A few screws grabbed me and took me down the block. After a couple of hours, I was released and taken back to the wing. Still hungry. Some of the men I knew in there got the con who had battered to drop the charges against me. One of the fellows was who helped was Rusty Jones from Kirby. He was a good friend of mine at the time. And the con who had smashed came over to me to apologise. I spat in his face and told him to F off. That's what you get in prisoners. Prisoners doing a screws job. You think they're screws themselves. After a few weeks on remand with bail being refused, I was finally taken to the committals court in Liverpool. The police had a witness against me. I knew Bobby Hughes would never in a million years grass on me. He and his brothers were staunch that way. The witness the police had was a barmaid, but when it came to her giving me evidence in court, she changed her mind. Not that she was scared of anything. The police were putting pressure on her, but she wouldn't budge. If you ever read this book, Caroline, thanks a million. I was finally set through, free through a lack of evidence. Sometime later, I think it was a couple of weeks, I was in my car with a lady friend. We'd just come out of the Adelphi Hotel. We decided to go to the Knightsbridge Club in Duke, Duke Street. While we were both in my car on the way to the club, it was suddenly rammed. A gang of fellas got out of the other car and came at me. A knife was pulled and I was stabbed in the top of my leg. The other one pulled a gun and shot me. I felt the bullet graze my stomach, just taking a layer off my skin. It all happened so fast. One of them was shouting, You haven't got your hatchet now, have you? They all seemed as if they were panicking. One of them kept shouting, Let's go! They all left as quickly as they came. I had good information a few days later that somebody had paid a so-called hitman by the name of Roy Grantham, who incidentally is now dead, who is from London. He must have needed glasses if it was him who tried to kill me. A good contract killer would put one in your head, not down below. The ones that aim for your legs just haven't got it in them to go all the way. Billy and Bobby Hughes and I got round the table and had a good talk. They knew who was responsible for stirring all this trouble up and putting the mix in. We agreed it was pointless going on with the family feud and we all parted on good terms. I still class Bobby Hughes as one of my good friends. In fact, the whole Hughes family are still staunch people. Not long after that senseless trouble we had with one another, the Hughes brothers and their firm came unstuck on some sorting office out of town. The armed police were lying in wait for them, and when they all steamed in to have the place off, the police opened fire on them. One of the firm, who doesn't want his name mentioned, and I will respect that, got shot by the armed police. He was lucky he lived. 
the bullet came out of his chest. I couldn't understand why Bobby was on the black. He was a wealthy man, and he certainly didn't need the money. I remember him telling me years later, Charlie, if you had been with us, we would never have got caught. I was always gifted with that extra sense somehow, and if something wasn't right, I would always stipulate, don't do it. They all ended up with lengthy sentences. Our team stayed with what we knew was the best method, having these sorting officers burgled and using our drilling equipment. Okay, so that was a chapter from Charlie Seeger's Killer. Brilliant book, old school. I've got the original hardback from it, but I believe you can get an Amazon Kindle one, and it's on the Kindle Unlimited for free. Um, and it's a really good book, especially when you look at some of the names in them and things that have happened to them later on down the line. These historic books are pretty good for that. So there's a link in the description. Click that link, and it, you can purchase the Amazon or if you wanted to get one of the hard copy books, you can do so. Um, I'm not sure what the situation with Charlie Seeger at the moment. Um, I'm guessing he must be knocking on a bit now. Um, I believe he's still alive. Um, I'm sure someone can tell me in the comments. And hopefully he's still getting the proceeds from all his books. He's got many a different book covering different things that happened to him. He got kidnapped and was brutally tortured by. Um, some younger villains and he covers that more in charlie seager's hyenas book i'll leave a link in the description for that as well uh, and maybe i'll do like a little extract from that to help promote it but i'm very interested in all the old liverpool um door stuff as well he was quite good friends charlie seager with joey owens joey owens has got a book he did all the doors um and he was pulled in for the Bromley murder, the infamous Bromley murder, um, Joey Owens and Charlie Seeger. And during this book, while he was writing it, Charlie Seeger was actually on remand in prison for that murder because it was at his house that it took place. And no one's ever really known who, you know, whether Charlie Seeger was involved or not, but he got off with that. Okay, so that's that for today. Um, if you're enjoying the, the content, please smash the likes just to show me. And if you hit subscribe, if you're not already subscribed, and notifications to so you know when the next upload's coming. With that being said, I'm out.